Hello everyone and uh, I hope you're keeping well in the pandemic and looking after yourselves. Welcome to my brief set of Life in the Universe pandemic series. These are just short talks about things that topics that I think are interesting to do with life in the universe in its widest context, the origin of life, uh, the evolution of life on Earth, is there life elsewhere, and the human exploration and settlement of space as well. And I hope they'll give you some sort of introduction to astrobiology. So today's question is this, what astrobiology can I do on the moon? Now that may seem like a rather strange question because most people don't really associate the moon with biology. We certainly don't think there's any life on the moon. People used to think that the moon had uh, intelligent lunarians living on there, but we now know that certainly today it's a dry, dusty, rocky world. So to talk about astrobiology on the moon seems like a little bit of a disconnect. But there is astrobiology we can do on the moon. There's lots of interesting questions that interface with biology and being on the moon. And of course, that is relevant because people are talking about going back to the moon, uh, the Artemis program, NASA's plan to uh, send astronauts back to the moon, the Chinese interest and growing uh, presence on the moon, and also a lot of commercial interest in lunar exploration and eventually uh, human exploration and settlement, as well as robotic exploration. So an interesting question to ask is, what has all this got to do with astrobiology? In fact, can astrobiologists do anything on the moon? And it turns out that they can. And in this short talk, I thought I would touch on maybe just two or three things that uh, bring astrobiology to the moon. And you can probably think of other ones as well. So the first interesting thing about the moon is that we have these craters at the polar regions that seem to be permanently shadowed. These are craters, if you can imagine, that are at the edge of the moon and they're sort of edge onto the sun. So that when you're inside, deep inside the crater, there's no sunlight that gets in there. The sun just sort of goes round and round and doesn't actually get into the crater to heat it up. And in these permanently shadowed craters of the lunar poles, some people think that there may be ices left over from ancient comets or carbon rich asteroidal material that collided on the moon in its early history and is preserved inside these craters. And these ices, these carbon rich materials are of enormous interest to astrobiologists because they might give us clues as to where the oceans of the Earth came from. Water is one of the fundamental requirements for life, liquid water. Where did all the water from the Earth come from? So by studying comets and asteroids, we get better ideas as to where those early oceans that eventually gave rise to life came from. So in those permanently shadowed craters, we might get ideas about the emergence of the early Earth. We also think that some of the carbon molecules, the carbon containing molecules, organic molecules within um, meteorites and comets were delivered to the early Earth and would have contributed to the inventory, the total number of molecules available to construct living things on the early Earth. So by looking at carbon rich molecules in comets and in asteroids, we can get some idea of the sort of material that was raining down on early Earth and could have been the building blocks, the Lego blocks, if you like, of early life on Earth. And some of that material might be in those permanently shadowed craters. So of course we can go to comets and we can go to asteroids and there are plenty of exciting missions to collect samples from comets and asteroids and bring them back to the Earth. But there may also be this material on the moon. And if you've got a base on the moon, maybe you can go and collect that, bring it back to the lab and study it. So this could be a very good way to get uh, good samples of ancient materials that have relevance to our understanding of early life on Earth, the origin of life on Earth, and the molecules from which it was constructed. So astrobiologists do actually have things to do on the moon in terms of collecting samples, not indigenous life, but samples that might tell us about ancient life on Earth. There's another interesting idea that has been pushed around for a while, and that is that giant asteroid impacts on the Earth would have lofted material into space, some of which would have left the Earth. And that's no speculation. We can collect Martian meteorites on the Earth, for example. So we even have pieces of Mars on the Earth that were launched from the surface of Mars. And in reverse, asteroid and comet impacts on the Earth would have launched pieces of the Earth into space. And some of that material would have been intercepted by the moon. So we could go to the moon and we could look for fragments of ancient Earth. Maybe we could find rocks from the earliest history of our planet, rocks that on our own planet have been heated and pressurized, metamorphosed and changed in ways that make them quite difficult to study or at least difficult to understand 
what they were like originally before they were, underwent this process of metamorphism. Maybe there are pieces of rock on the moon that although they've been uh, shocked during the asteroid and comet impact, they've been relatively less affected. Of course, they might have been crushed up and destroyed, uh, gardened, as we say, on the surface of the moon, so they may not be in very good shape, but there at least is another potential direction for astrobiologists to get access to rocks from the early history of the Earth, or earlier history than today, to tell us something about the geology, maybe even biosignatures of life on early Earth. There are other more um, everyday things that we can learn on the moon. Uh, the moon is, of course, a place that has no significant atmosphere. It's bathed in interplanetary radiation. It's bathed in high uh, levels of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. It's quite a toxic environment. And we want to know about the effects of radiation on biology. If we send humans to Mars and they're drifting through interplanetary space, what is the effect of all that radiation on the human body? And the surface of the moon can give us a laboratory to address those sorts of questions. For example, if we have a a base on the moon that's got human beings in it, they can set up experiments around their base of maybe some biological cultures, maybe some materials, maybe some bacteria, and they can leave them out there and they can study the way in which the radiation breaks down that biological material, the way it damages biological material. They can bring those samples back into the lunar lab, they can study them and they can investigate the effects of the different radiations on the surface of the moon on that biology. And the radiation environment is actually quite complex. We talk about radiation in this mundane way as if there's only one type of radiation, but of course there's ionizing radiation that's made up of protons and heavy ions, and is actually quite a complex mixture of different particles that affect biology. Ultraviolet radiation from the sun comes in a wide variety of wavelengths, different wavelengths, have different effects on biology. So it's quite difficult actually to understand in detail the effects of radiation on biological material. So sitting on the moon in our station in a nice settled environment where we can bring things into the lab and take them out again and expose them to the lunar radiation environment could be a very good way for us to radically advance our understanding of interplanetary radiation conditions with applications to future missions beyond the moon to Mars and other locations. And quite apart from that, we may also gain simply fundamental insights onto the effects in the effects of radiation on biological material, which might have implications for everything from chemotherapy to simply trying to understand the way in which radiation uh, on Earth affects biology, even if it's at a much lower level than on the moon, we can still gain fundamental insights into the way in which life interacts with radiation. So the moon can be a very good biological laboratory to learn all sorts of things about how biology and biochemistry works. Uh, there are other things that have some sort of biological significance. Some people have talked about building giant radio telescopes on the far side of the moon where it's nice and quiet, away from all that radio chit chat uh, spewing out from the earth. And if people build radio telescopes, of course, they could use those telescopes to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We still obviously have not picked up a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence, but it is just another aspect of astrobiology, another biological question that we might ask. Is there intelligent life out there in the universe that could be addressed using telescopes on the moon? And then, of course, we also want to understand how human beings can live off the Earth in interplanetary bases. What sort of microbes develop inside closed stations? What sort of viruses uh, become established inside planetary stations. Here we are worrying about coronavirus. If you're living in a small interplanetary station on the moon, what sort of viruses uh, become established there? What is the possibility of new viruses and new um, diseases being introduced by people arriving in your station? You don't really want to build a station on the moon and then have someone, uh, or on Mars, for example, and have someone arrive and introduce a new disease that has some terrible effect on your little population of people living on Mars. So the moon being much closer to the Earth is a very good place to learn about these things over long periods of time. If we build a station on the moon, we can study the changing flora, the microbial flora associated with the people in that station. We could look at microbes on surfaces, we could look at viruses, and we could start to build up a very detailed understanding of how the microbiology, the microbiome as it's called, uh, develops inside planetary stations and affects the way in which people can live in interplanetary space, eventually on Mars, maybe even missions beyond Mars into deep space, even beyond our solar system.
So the moon doesn't look like a place that's really associated with biology, but in fact, there are a wide range of scientific questions that uh, interface with biology. And let's just very briefly review those questions about the origin of life on Earth, where the, the raw materials came from to build early life on Earth, where our oceans came from, uh, the nature of life on early Earth that may be stored in uh, rocks lofted by asteroid impacts, knowledge about radiation and its effect on biology, knowledge about the general interplanetary environment and its effects on humans and other types of life as well, and then knowledge about how we can build successful stations on other planetary bodies, and then maybe even more speculatively, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So from the humblest experiment on the origin of life right the way through to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and everywhere in between, there are all sorts of biology questions that can be asked on the moon. So lunar astrobiology, not quite so mad as you think. In fact, the moon is a very good place to do lots of astrobiology. And as stations become established on the moon in the forthcoming decades, we can expect uh, a rich future for those people investigating questions in astrobiology and planetary sciences that can advance uh, these fascinating areas to do with life in the universe. Thanks a lot for joining me again. Take care of yourselves.